422, Chapter 30 of the Count of Monte Cristo. Book talk begins at 1207. Welcome to Craplet, the podcast for crafters who love books. My name is Heather Ordover, and I'm podcasting from where the Delaware River meets the Old York Road, New Hope, Pennsylvania. 422. Sticky. This episode of Craftlet is brought to you by its listeners. Many thanks and much gratefulness to all of the listeners who have gone over to patreon.com slash craftlet and pledged their support to the show. We couldn't do it without you. Thank you. Willaloo! I don't know about you, but where I am, it is hot, humid, and sticky. So hi, summer! (laughs) Fourth of July hits and all of a sudden everything gets yicky outside. But it is early and therefore a little bit cooler and a little less humid, and that's why I'm able to record right now. Otherwise, I, th- I think my little recording booth would feel a lot like the inside of James's peach, just dripping, but probably wouldn't taste as good if I licked the walls. It's just clammy. <laughs> anyway, enough of that. Summer is here. Kids are swimming. Uh, thing one is in Alice. That is Alice in Wonderland. It's, it seems like a kind of a hybrid between the book and a Disney version. And he is the Red King, so he's very excited because it's good to be the king. And Thing One has launched his very first actual website. It is Far From Reality, and that's hyphenated, far hyphen from hyphen reality.com. And he's populating it with comics that he has written and drawn himself. And I'm really quite proud of him. He's been working on this for a while. If you've been listening long enough to remember Doofus Del Fuego way back in the day, this is the next iteration. Doofus is actually still in play. He's just not on the website yet. But yeah, the kid's really committed to this, and he's, I think he's done a pretty amazing job. So go ahead and feel free to visit and leave a comment if you so desire. And since non-sticky time is of a premium, I'm going to move us along to the crafty chat. (laughs) So hello! Um, I actually have very little in the crafting department this week. So Tour de Fleece is on. Woo! My goal is to ply all these babies. Wow. At, well, actually, these and the ones that aren't in the bag anymore. So I'm doing it on my spindle, and I have my Lazy Kate all set up. So I spun on the first day of Tour de Fleece, which was Saturday, and then Sunday... I had a headache off and on all day, so I did not spin. And yesterday we were busy with 4th of July hoop-de-doo, so I did not spin. So I'm really lame as far as team captains go, (laughs) only having spun one day out of the three so far. So That's not lame, though. That makes makes your people feel less inadequate. No, okay. Well, I got plenty of imperfections to help make people not feel inadequate. Um... (laughs) I'm actually reading a book about that right now, but embracing your imperfections. So that's a, that's a wool silk blend. It's actually two different fibers that are the same color. And I accidentally bought two different fibers. One's Biffle silk, the other's Merino silk. And at this point, I don't know what's what. It doesn't matter. It's all the same color. It's all getting spun and plied together. So there's that. And that's from Bee Mice Elf. I love that name. Bought that fiber at my first... Cognitive fiber retreat. Hello, Dr. Gemma. Um, The other thing about the spinning is, Erica, I had a question for you. When you spin at home on your spindle, like we all talk about having TV time when we we knit in front of the television and we just do this uh kind of potato chip knitting. Right. When you are doing your spindling, are Mm -hmm. you standing? Are you watching TV? Are you walking somewhere where do you post yourself and find time to spindle i stand in my living room Mm -hmm. usually to the left of my couch um (laughs) i can gps plot you now (laughs) yeah and um it's usually with the with the tv on 
in the background. And if I, even if I were spinning on my wheel, there would be something in the background. It's funny. I don't usually do podcasts while I spin. Yeah. Uh, usually more of the something on the TV. I used to put down a yoga mat on the floor Ooh. to muffle any sounds if I dropped my spindle. <laughs> that I wouldn't get as many complaints from the peanut gallery, but I don't drop quite as often anymore and I'm not quite as considerate of the peanut gallery, so I don't do that anymore. <laughs> and at a barbecue, for me, with no, no bread, no flour, I used two peppers for my hamburger bun. Oh, and it was genius. Great. It was very yummy. A little messy on the hands, but that's okay. I'm used to that. Messy's good. Uh, but that's a nice change from the lettuce leaf thing, which is what right. I had to resort to for so long. Right. So I like that. Crooked Knits says she has a hard time at, at uh, barbecues eating because she's vegetarian. So she brings cowboy caviar. That's, um, is, that's the salsa bean... that has the beans in it? I think so. I love that uh, stuff. And and Italian dressing, and we're both watching the chat to see if yeah, she's I'm not back. I'm not sure, but I I know I've seen it a million times on Pinterest I, and stuff. I'm so um, glad she said that though because I forgot I used to make that all the time, and the boys loved it. And I was trying to figure out what to make for dinner, and I I just remembered the way that I'd I'd first learned about this the cowboy caviar thing was from a res restaurant in New York City called the Cowgirl Hall of Fame. And it yeah. is, it is so much fun. It's in the village and it's just, it's just a great place to go. It was black eyed peas. I couldn't remember what the, oh, what right. the bean was. And you, you sub chickpeas. Okay. I just came across a recipe where somebody had substituted those. And I thought, Ooh, I hadn't seen that before, but no. There were black eyed peas yesterday too. Really? And actually An Andrew said they were really good. She made them a little differently because she used, instead of cooking it with ham or bacon mm -hmm. she used sausage and some turkey wings Ooh. some smoked Ooh. turkey wings oh i like and that. It, he said it was really good he brought home a lot of it so right there's going to be black eyed peas for days around here i support that anybody who's listened to the podcast for a long time knows that i hate hate mosquitoes and don't do well with getting bites and thing two is very similar but he's also kind of paranoid from getting bit by ants so any kind of bug he's just really he's over and they went kayaking yesterday and there were a bunch of gnats and and even dragonflies which don't bug me really so i went looking for a mosquito netting hat like an australian outback kind of hat oh with, yeah, yeah, yeah. Net. okay I will put links in the show notes. L.L. Bean has a $14.95 big netting. It's a black netting because it's easier to see through than the white netting. It's a big netting. It has weights around the bottom, so it'll just kind of sit on your shoulders. And it fits over any hat from the Australian hat bag. It, it looks like it comes with a hat, and it doesn't. It, it's just the netting. But people in the comments were saying they wore it with baseball hats. They wore it with uh, Outback hats, with pith helmets, with all sorts of stuff. And... 100% of the comments said, wow, this totally saved our life. And oh, then wow. it linked from there, geniusly, to another page on L.L. Bean's website that was a, it's a, a, like a windbreaker. It's a super lightweight jacket that's been treated with promethazone, the stuff that they make from dandelions. It's a natural, non-deet, bugs don't like the smell of it, so they go away. Nice. Which includes deer ticks, which is awesome. Oh, good. And so they, they are selling the pants that are treated with this stuff too. Those are crazy expensive. But the windbreaker thing that came with mitts was all, I think it was $38. I'll find the link again. But I showed it to him and said, do you think if you had something on you so that you knew that the bugs couldn't touch you, that it would be better? And he said, I would be outside all the time. Done. Nice. So, that was a happy thing to find. So I'm getting the the face, the hat one, and he's getting the jacket, and then we'll see if we need to get more. But I was very happy about that. 
So I asked a question on the Crafty Chat this week that was kind of dim because the people who were there already knew all the things. Uh, My question to you, however, is this. On the show notes, I have been, uh, for the last couple of months, I've been posting all of the links with time codes back to the YouTube video so that if you wanted to see something that I didn't include in the podcast, but you wanted to go and take a look at it on the video, there was an easy way to do that. My question to you is this. Is it worth that to add those links or is it enough to just take a couple of screenshots, link to those times in the video, and then once you're there, if you wanted to look at the time code notes below the video and see if there was anything else you wanted to hear about or watch or listen, would that make more sense? Because if you don't need to have the links in the regular show notes, all of the links in the regular show notes, then it would be a lot easier for me to just not do them anymore. But to find out what you think, there is a very brief, it's like a one question poll over on craftlit.com slash 422. And if you go and you take the poll, you will be able to see links back to two different examples of what I was asking about. So that would be very helpful. I want to make sure I'm giving you what you want. And thank you, those of you who have called in to let me know about this podcast and other podcasts, uh, especially the other podcasts, because Craftlet is kind of weird in the podcasting world. Other podcasts have very different formats than Craftlet does. So a big thank you to those who've called into the phone line 206-350-1642 to let me know the things that really work for you, as well as the things that really don't because this is all going into the talk that I'm giving in September about podcasting and what podcast listeners need to be able to concentrate and to be able to remember and to be able to use the information that we're hearing. And now, The Count of Monte Cristo. I am so excited to be able to bring you today's chapter, chapter 30. This one is a big deal for me, and I think you'll see why at the end. And I mean the end, the very end. So just a couple of things to know going into this. One, back to money. 1,000 francs back then, 1820, is roughly, and of course this is very roughly, about $13,700 United States money right now. So almost $14,000 US. If you can kind of keep that in the back of your head, you'll be able to ballpark some bigger numbers. So again, a thousand francs back then, about mm, roughly 14,000 US dollars now. Second thing, Stoics. Stoicism is really interesting and it's really complicated because it's so, in many ways, so distant from what we think of when we think of philosophy or religion. And so we've kind of gotten into the habit of thinking, oh, Stoicism equals Spock. And that's a start. But there's more to Stoicism than that. And I'm not even going to be able to give you a complete tip of the iceberg, but I can give you a couple of pieces to keep in mind. Stoicism had three parts to it, logic, physics, and ethics. All three were needed. All three were necessary. All three were important. Logic and reason in Platonic thinking had everything to do with what you couldn't see. That's where you get the platonic ideal, this ideal that horses are horses. And the concept of horse is very fluid. You can be a baby horse, you can be a grown-up horse, you can be a dying horse, you can be a strong horse, you could be a weak horse, you could be brown horse, you could be white horse. All different horses, but all of them are, in fact, horses. In platonic thought, there is a platonic ideal of a horse, kind of a perfect vision of what horse means. And, and that's when you say something like that's a platonic ideal of a horse is like a horse qua horse. It is horse, capital letters, the ideal. Stoicism doesn't stay up in that kind of heady area of thought and the unseen. Stoicism was very much based in physical reality. And one of the things that they thought was a reality was reason and 
logic. And ethics were inherently wrapped up in that. But then the weird part, or what seems to be very weird to me, is instead of that leading to a kind of a hedonistic, the physical is all that matters, and by physical what I'm really saying is pleasure, the Stoics went the other direction. All pleasure, all pain, all of that stuff, that doesn't matter. What matters is is reason. And you can tell when you are being reasonable because you are in sync with nature. And nature's state is inherently logical and reasonable. And actually, I'm going to read you a, a paragraph that I got off of a, a philosophy dictionary website that was written, peer-reviewed and written by philosophers. So I kind of thought it was good. It says, Stoicism is essentially a system of ethics, which, however is guided by a logic as a theory of method and rests upon physics as a foundation. Briefly, their notion of morality is stern, involving a life in accordance with nature and controlled by virtue. It is an ascetic system, teaching perfect indifference, apathy, to everything external, for nothing external could be either good or evil. Hence, to the Stoics, both pain and pleasure Poverty and riches, sickness and health, were supposed to be equally unimportant. Aristotle, though, in his broad and moderate way, believed virtue alone to possess intrinsic value, yet allowed to external goods and circumstances a place in the scheme of life. The Stoics asserted that virtue alone is good, vice alone is evil, and that everything else is absolutely indifferent. Poverty, sickness, pain, death, they're not evil. Riches, health, pleasure, and life are not good. A person could commit suicide, for in destroying his life, he destroys nothing of value. Above all, pleasure is not a good. One ought not to seek pleasure. Virtue is the only happiness, and people must be virtuous, not for the sake of pleasure, but for the sake of duty. And since virtue alone is good, vice alone evil, there followed the further paradox that all virtues are equally good and all vices are equally evil. There are no degrees. It's fascinating. And I found a New York Times article. This was written in 2015. A modern day guy is writing about being a stoic now and that there's actually groups meeting. There's like National Stoic Day. And people are starting to look at this philosophy. And I'm sure, based on what I read, that there's a lot to this whole philosophy. But I think the important part for us is the line that I read that says, virtue is the only happiness and people must be virtuous, not for the sake of pleasure, but for the sake of duty. It's all going to come clear very, very soon. In fact, very, very soon, because let's listen to the book. Here we go with today's chapter 30 of The Count of Monte Cristo by Alexandre Dumas, read for us by David Clark. Chapter 30, the 5th of September. The extension provided for by the agent of Thompson and French at the moment when Morella expected at least was to the poor ship owner so decided a stroke of good fortune that he almost dared to believe that fate was at length grown weary of wasting her spite upon him. The same day he told his wife, Emmanuel, and his daughter all that had occurred, and a ray of hope, if not of tranquillity, returned to the family. Unfortunately, however, Morel had not only engagements with the house of Thomason and French, who had shown themselves so considerate toward him, and as he had said, in business he had correspondence and not friends. When he thought the matter over, he could by no means account for this generous conduct on the part of Thompson and French towards him, and could only attribute it to some such selfish argument as this. We had better help a man who owes us nearly 300,000 francs, and have those 300,000 francs at the end of three months, than hasten his ruin, and get only six or eight percent of our money back again. Unfortunately, whether through envy or stupidity, all Morel's correspondents did not take this view, and some even came to a contrary decision. 
The bills signed by Morel were presented at his office with scrupulous exactitude, and thanks to the delay granted by the Englishman, were paid by Cochler with equal punctuality. Cochler thus remained in his accustomed tranquillity. It was Morel alone who remembered with alarm that if he had to repay on the 15th the 50,000 francs of Monsieur de Beauville, and on the 30th the 32,500 francs of bills, for which, as well as the debt due to the inspector of prisons, he had time granted, he must be a ruined man. The opinion of all the commercial men was that under the reverses which had successfully weighed down Morel, it was impossible for him to remain solvent. Great, therefore, was the astonishment when at the end of the month he cancelled all his obligations with his usual punctuality. Still, confidence was not restored to all minds, and the general opinion was that the complete ruin of the unfortunate shipowner had been postponed only until the end of the month. The month passed, and Morel made extraordinary efforts to get in all his resources. Formerly his paper, at any date, was taken with confidence, and was even in request. Morel now tried to negotiate bills at ninety days only, and none of the banks would give him credit. Fortunately, Morel had some funds coming in on which he could rely, and as they reached him, he found himself in a condition to meet his engagements when the end of July came. The agent of Thompson and French had not been again seen at Marseille. The day after, or two days after his visit to Morel, he had disappeared, and as in that city he had no intercourse but with the mayor, the inspector of prisons, and Monsieur Morel, his departure left no trace, except in the memories of those three persons. As to the sailors of the Ferron, they must have found snug berths elsewhere, for they also had disappeared. Captain Gomard, recovered from his illness, had returned from Palma. He delayed presenting himself at Morel's, but the owner, hearing of his arrival, went to see him. The worthy shipowner knew from Penelon's recital of the captain's brave conduct during the storm, and tried to console him. He brought him also the amount of his wages, which Captain Gomard had not dared to apply for. As he descended the staircase, Morel met Penelon, who was going up. Penelon had, it would seem, made good use of his money, for he was newly clad. When he saw his employer, the worthy tar seemed much embarrassed drew on one side into the corner of the landing-place, passed his quid from one cheek to the other, stared stupidly with his great eyes, and only acknowledged the squeeze of the hand which Morel, as usual, gave him by a slight pressure in return. Morel attributed Penelon's embarrassment to the elegance of his attire. It was evident the good fellow had not gone to such an expense on his own account. He was, no doubt, engaged on board some other vessel, and thus his bashfulness arose from the fact of this not having, if we may so express ourselves, worn mourning for the pharaoh and longer. Perhaps he had come to tell Captain Gomard of his good luck, and to offer him employment from his own new master. "'Worthy fellows,' said Morel as he went away, "'may your new master love you as I loved you, and be more fortunate than I have been.' August rolled by in unceasing efforts on the part of Morel to renew his credit or revive the old. On the 20th of August, it was known at Marseille that he had left town in the mail coach, and it was said that the bills would go to protests at the end of the month, and that Morel had gone away and left his chief clerk, Emmanuel, and his cashier, Cocle, to meet the creditors. But contrary to all expectation, when the 31st of August came, the house opened as usual, and Cochler appeared behind the grating of the counter, examined all bills presented with the usual scrutiny, and from first to last paid all with the usual precision. There came in, moreover, two drafts which Monsieur Morel had fully anticipated, and which Cochler paid as punctually as the bills which the shipowner had accepted. All this was incomprehensible. And then, with a tenacity peculiar to profits of bad news, the failure was put off until the end of September. On the 1st, Morel returned, and he was awaited by his family with extreme anxiety, for from this journey to Paris they hoped great things. Morel had thought of Donglar, who was now immensely rich, and had lain under great obligations to Morel in former days, since to him it was owing that Donglar entered the service of the Spanish banker, 
with whom he had laid the foundations of his vast wealth. It was said at this moment that Donglard was worth from six to eight millions of francs, and had unlimited credit. Donglard, then, without taking a crown from his pocket, could save Morel. He had but to pass his word for a loan, and Morel was saved. Morel had long thought of Donglard, but had kept away from some instinctive motive, and had delayed as long as possible, availing himself of this last resource. And Morel was right, for he returned home crushed by the humiliation of a refusal. Yet on his arrival, Morel did not utter a complaint or say one harsh word. He embraced his weeping wife and daughter, pressed Emmanuel's hand with friendly warmth, and then going to his private room on the second floor, had sent for Cocle. Then, said the two women to Emmanuel, we are indeed ruined. It was agreed in a brief council held among them that Julie should write to her brother, who was in garrison at Nîmes, to come to them as speedily as possible. The poor women felt instinctively that they required all their strength to support the blow that impended. Besides, Maximilien Morel, though hardly two-and-twenty, had great influence over his father. He was a strong-minded, upright young man. At the time when he decided on his profession, his father had no desire to choose for him, but it consulted young Maximilian's taste. He had at once declared for a military life, and had in consequence studied hard, passed brilliantly through the Polytechnic School, and left it as sub-lieutenant of the 53rd on the line. For a year he had held his rank, and expected promotion on the first vacancy. In his regiment, Maximilian Morel was noted for his rigid observance not only of the obligations imposed on a soldier, but also of the duties of a man, and he thus gained the name of the Stoic. We need hardly say that many of those who gave him this epithet repeated it because they had heard it, and did not even know what it meant. This was the young man whom his mother and sister called to their aid to sustain them under the serious trial which they felt they would soon have to endure. They had not mistaken the gravity of this event, for the moment after Morel had entered his private office with Cocle, Julie saw the latter leave it pale, trembling, and his features betraying the utmost consternation. She would have questioned him as he passed by her, but the worthy creature hastened down the staircase with unusual precipitation, and only raised his hands to heaven and exclaimed, "'Oh, mademoiselle, mademoiselle, what a dreadful misfortune!' Who could ever have believed it? A moment afterwards, Julie saw him go upstairs carrying two of three heavy ledgers, a portfolio, and a bag of money. Morel examined the ledgers, opened the portfolio, and counted the money. All his funds amounted to 6,000 or 8,000 francs, his bills receivable up to the fifth to 4,000 or 5,000, which, making the best of everything, gave him 14,000 francs to meet debts amounting to 287,500 francs. He had not even the means for making a possible settlement on account. However, when Morel went down to his dinner, he appeared very calm. This calmness was more alarming to the two women than the deepest dejection would have been. After dinner, Morel usually went out and used to take his coffee at the Fosséan Club and read the semaphore. This day he did not leave the house, but returned to his office. As to Cocle, he seemed completely bewildered. For part of the day he went into the courtyard, seated himself on a stone with his head bare and exposed to the blazing sun. Emmanuel tried to comfort the women, but his eloquence faltered. The young man was too well acquainted with the business of the house, not to feel that a great catastrophe hung over the Morel family. Night came. The two women had watched, hoping that when he left this room, Morel would come to them. But they heard him pass before their door, and trying to conceal the noise of his footsteps. They listened. He went into his sleeping room, and fastened the door inside. Madame Morel sent her daughter to bed, and half an hour after Julie had retired, she rose, took off her shoes, and went stealthily along the passage to see through the keyhole what her husband was doing. In the passage she saw a retreating shadow. It was Julie, 
who uneasy herself had anticipated her mother. The young lady went towards Madame Morel. He is writing, she said. They had understood each other without speaking. Madame Morel looked again through the keyhole. Morel was writing. But Madame Morel remarked, what her daughter had not observed, that her husband was writing on stamped paper. The terrible idea that he was writing his will flashed across her. She shuddered, and yet had not strength to utter a word. Next day, Monsieur Morel seemed as calm as ever, went into his office as usual, came to his breakfast punctually, and then, after dinner, he placed his daughter beside him, took her head in his arms, and held her for a long time against his bosom. In the evening, Julie told her mother that although he was apparently so calm, she had noticed that her father's heart beat violently. The next two days passed in much the same way. On the evening of the 4th of September, Monsieur Morel asked his daughter for the key of his study. Julie trembled at this request, which seemed to her of bad omen. Why did her father ask for this key which she always kept, and which was only taken from her in childhood as a punishment? The young girl looked at Morel. "'What have I done wrong, father?' she said. "'That you should take this key from me.' "'Nothing, my dear,' replied the unhappy man, the tears starting to his eyes at this simple question. "'Nothing. Only I want it.' Julie made a pretense to feel for the key. "'I must have left it in my room,' she said, and she went out, but instead of going to her apartment, she hastened to consult Emmanuel. "'Do not give this key to your father.' said he, and tomorrow morning, if possible, do not quit him for a moment. She questioned Emmanuel, but he knew nothing or would not say what he knew. During the night between the 4th and 5th of September, Madame Morel remained listening for every sound, and until three o'clock in the morning she heard her husband pacing the room in great agitation. It was three o'clock when he threw himself on the bed. The mother and daughter passed the night together. They had expected Maximilian since the previous evening. At eight o'clock in the morning, Morel entered their chamber. He was calm, but the agitation of the night was legible on his pale and careworn visage. They did not dare to ask him how he had slept. Morel was kinder to his wife, more affectionate to his daughter than he had ever been. He could not cease gazing at and kissing the sweet girl. Julie, mindful of Emmanuel's request, was following her father when he quitted the room. But he said to her quickly, Remain with your mother, dearest. Julie wished to accompany him. I wish you to do so, said he. This was the first time Morel had ever so spoken. But he said it in a tone of paternal kindness, and Julie did not dare to disobey. She remained at the same spot, standing mute and motionless. An instant afterwards the door opened. She felt two arms encircle her, and a mouth pressed her forehead. She looked up and uttered an exclamation of joy. Maximilien, my dearest brother, she cried. At these words, Madame Morel rose and threw herself into her son's arm. Mother, said the young man, looking alternately at Madame Morel and her daughter, what has occurred? What has happened? Your letters has frightened me, and I have come hither with all speed. Julie, said Madame Morel, making a sign to the young man, go and tell your father that Maximilian has just arrived. The young lady rushed out of the apartment, but on the first step of the staircase she found a man holding a letter in his hand. Are you not a mademoiselle Julie Morel? inquired the man with a strong Italian accent. Yes, sir replied Julie, with hesitation. What is your pleasure? I do not know you. Read this letter, he said, handing it to her. Julie hesitated. It concerns the best interests of your father, said the messenger. The young girl hastily took the letter from him. She opened it quickly and read, Go this moment to the Allée de Meillon. Enter the house number 15. Ask the porter for the key of the room on the fifth floor. Enter the apartment. Take from the corner of the mantelpiece a purse netted in red silk and give it to your father. 
It is important that he should receive it before eleven o'clock. You promised to obey me implicitly. Remember your oath. Sinbad the Sailor. The young girl uttered a joyful cry, raised her eyes, looked round to question the messenger, but he had disappeared. She cast her eyes again over the note to peruse it a second time and saw there was a postscript. She read, it is important that you should fulfil this mission in person and alone. If you go accompanied by any other person, or should anyone else go in your place, the porter will reply that he does not know anything about it. This postscript decreased greatly the young girl's happiness. Was there nothing to fear? Was there not some snare laid for her? Her innocence had kept her in ignorance of the dangers that might assail a young girl of her age, but there is no need to know danger in order to fear it. Indeed, it may be observed that it is usually unknown perils that inspire the greatest terror. Julie hesitated and resolved to take counsel. Yet through a singular impulse, it was neither to her mother nor her brother that she applied, but to Emmanuel. She hastened down and told him what had occurred on the day when the agent of Thompson and French had come to her father's, related the scene on the staircase, repeated the promise she had made, and showed him the letter. "'You must go then, mademoiselle,' said Emmanuel. "'Go there?' murmured Julie. "'Yes, I will accompany you.' "'But did you not read that I must be alone?' said Julie. "'And you shall be alone,' replied the young man. "'I will await you at the corner of the Rue de Musée, "'and if you are so long absent as to make me uneasy, "'I will hasten to rejoin you.' and woe to him of whom you shall have cause to complain to me. Then, Emmanuel, said the young girl with hesitation, it is your opinion that I should obey this invitation? Yes, did not the messenger say your father's safety depended upon it? But what danger threatens him, then, Emmanuel? she asked. Emmanuel hesitated a moment, but his desire to make Julie decide immediately made him reply, Listen, he said, today is the 5th of September, is it not? Yes. Today then, at 11 o'clock, your father has nearly 300,000 francs to pay. Yes, we know that. Well then, continued Emmanuel, we have not 15,000 francs in the house. What will happen then? Why, if today before 11 o'clock, your father has not found someone who will come to his aid, he will be compelled at twelve o'clock to declare himself bankrupt. Oh, come then, come, cried she, hastening away with the young man. During this time, Madame Morel had told her son everything. The young man knew quite well that, after the succession of misfortunes which had befallen his father, great changes had taken place in the style of living and housekeeping. But he did not know that matters had reached such a point he was thunderstruck. Then rushing hastily out of the apartment, he ran upstairs, expecting to find his father in his study. But he rapped there in vain. While he was yet at the door of the study, he heard the bedroom door open, turned and saw his father. Instead of going direct to his study, Monsieur Morel had returned to his bedchamber, which he was only this moment quitting. Morel uttered a cry of surprise at the sight of his son, of whose arrival he was ignorant. He remained motionless, on the spot, pressing with his left hand something he had concealed under his coat. Maximilian sprang down the staircase and threw his arms around his father's neck, but suddenly he recoiled and placed his right hand on Morel's breast. Father, he exclaimed, turning pale as death, what are you going to do with that brace of pistols under your coat? Oh, this is what I feared, said Morel. Father, father, in heaven's name, exclaimed the young man, what are these weapons for? Maximilian, replied Morel, looking fixedly at his son, you are a man, and a man of honour. Come, and I will explain to you. And with a firm step, Morel went up to his study, while Maximilian followed him, trembling as he went. Morel opened the door and closed it behind his son, then crossing his anteroom, went to his desk on which he placed the pistols 
and pointed with his finger to an open ledger. In this ledger was made out an exact balance sheet of his affairs. Morel had to pay within half an hour 287,500 francs. All he possessed was 15,257 francs. Read, said Morel. The young man was overwhelmed as he read. Morel said not a word. What could he say? What need he add to such a desperate proof in figures? And have you done all that is possible, father, to meet this disastrous result? asked the young man after a moment's pause. I have, replied Morel. You have no money coming in on which you can rely? None. You have exhausted every resource? All. And in half an hour, said Maximilian in a gloomy voice, our name is dishonoured. Blood washes out dishonour, said Morel. You are right, father. I understand you. Then extending his hand towards one of the pistols, he said, There is one for you and one for me. Thanks. Morel caught his hand. Your mother, your sister, who will support them? A shudder ran through the young man's frame. Father, he said, do you reflect that you are bidding me to live? Yes, I do. I do so bid you, answered Morel. It is your duty. You have a calm, strong mind, Maximilian. Maximilian, you are no ordinary man. I make no requests or commands. I only ask you to examine my position as if it were your own and then judge for yourself. The young man reflected for a moment. Then an expression of sublime resignation appeared in his eyes, and with a slow and sad gesture he took off his two epaulets, the insignia of his rank. Be it so then, my father, he said, extending his hand to Morel. Die in peace, my father. I will live. Morel was about to cast himself on his knees before his son, but Maximilian caught him in his arms, and those two noble hearts were pressed against each other for a moment. You know, it is not my fault, said Morel. Maximilian smiled. I know, father. You are the most honourable man I have ever known. Good, my son. And now there is no more to be said. Go and rejoin your mother and sister. My father, said the young man, bending his knee, bless me. Morel took the head of his son between his two hands, drew him forward, and kissing his forehead several times, said, Oh, yes, yes, I bless you in my own name, and in the name of three generations of irreproachable men, who say through me, The edifice which misfortune has destroyed, providence may build up again. On seeing me die such a death, the most inexorable will have pity on you. To you, perhaps, they will accord the time they have refused to me. Then do your best to keep our name free from dishonour. Go to work, labour, young man, struggle ardently and courageously, live yourself, your mother and sister, with the most rigid economy, so that from the day-to-day -day property of those whom I leave in your hands may augment and fructify. Reflect how glorious a day it will be, how grand, how solemn, that day of complete restoration on which you will say in this very office, my father died because he could not do what I have this day done, but he died calmly and peaceably, because in dying he knew what I should do. My father, my father, cried the young man, why should you not live? If I live, all would be changed. If I live, interest would be converted into doubt, pity into hostility. If I live, I am only a man who has broken his word, failed in his engagements, in fact, only a bankrupt. If, on the contrary, I die, remember, Maximilian, my corpse is that of an honest but unfortunate man. Living, my best friends would avoid my house. 
dead, all Marseille will follow me in tears to my last home. Living, you would feel shame at my name. Dead, you may raise your head and say, I am the son of him you killed, because for the first time he has been compelled to break his word. The young man uttered a groan, but appeared resigned. And now, said Morel, leave me alone and endeavor to keep your mother and sister away. Will you not see my sister once more? asked Maximilian. A last but final hope was concealed by the young man in the effect of this interview, and therefore he had suggested it. Morel shook his head. I saw her this morning and bade her adieu. Have you no particular commands to leave with me, my father? inquired Maximilian in a faltering voice. Yes, my son, and a sacred command. Say it, my father. The house of Thompson and French is the only one who from humanity or it may be selfishness, it is not for me to read men's hearts, has had any pity for me. Its agent will in ten minutes present himself to receive the amount of a bill of 287,500 francs. I will not say granted, but offered me three months. Let this house be the first repaid, my son, and respect this man. Father, I will, said Maximilian. And now once more, adieu, said Morel. Go, leave me. I would be alone. You will find my will in the secretary, in my bedroom. The young man remained standing and motionless, having but the force of will and not the power of execution. Hear me, Maximilian, said his father. Suppose I was a soldier like you and ordered to carry a certain redoubt and you knew I must be killed in the assault. Would you not say to me, as you said just now, Go, father, for you are dishonored by delay, and death is preferable to shame. Yes, yes, said the young man, yes. And once again embracing his father with convulsive pressure, he said, Be it so, my father. And he rushed out of the study. When his son had left him, Morel remained an instant, standing with his eyes fixed on the door, then, putting forth his arm, he pulled the bell. After a moment's interval, Gokla appeared. It was no longer the same man. The fearful revelations of the three last days had crushed him. This thought, the house of Morel is about to stop payment, bent him to the earth more than twenty years would otherwise have done. My worthy Gokla, said Morel in a tone impossible to describe, do you remain in the antechamber? When the gentleman who came three months ago, the agent of Thompson and French, arrives, announce his arrival to me. Cocle made no reply. He made a sign with his head, went into the anteroom and seated himself. Morel fell back in his chair, his eyes fixed on the clock. There were seven minutes left. That was all. The hand moved on with incredible rapidity. He seemed to see its motion. What passed in the mind of this man at the supreme moment of his agony cannot be told in words. He was still comparatively young. He was surrounded by the loving care of a devoted family. But he had convinced himself by a course of reasoning, illogical perhaps, yet certainly plausible, that he must separate himself from all he held dear in the world, even life itself. To form the slightest idea of his feelings, one must have seen his face with its expression of enforced resignation and its tear-moistened eyes raised to heaven. The minute hand moved on. The pistols were loaded. He stretched forth his hand, took one up, and murmured his daughter's name. Then he laid it down, seized his pen, and wrote a few words. It seemed to him as if he had not taken a sufficient farewell of his beloved daughter. Then he turned again to the clock, counting time now, not by minutes, but by seconds. He took up the deadly weapon again. 
his lips parted and his eyes fixed on the clock, and then shuddered at the click of the trigger as he cocked the pistol. At this moment of mortal anguish, the cold sweat came forth upon his brow. A pang stronger than death clutched at his heartstrings. He heard the door of the staircase creak on its hinges. The clock gave its warning to strike eleven. The door of his study opened. Morel did not turn around. He expected these words of Cochle, the agent of Thompson and French. He placed the muzzle of the pistol between his teeth. Suddenly he heard a cry. It was his daughter's voice. He turned and saw Julie. The pistol fell from his hands. My father, cried the young girl out of breath and half dead with joy. Saved! You are saved! And she threw herself into his arms, holding in her extended hand a red netted silk purse. Saved, my child? said Morel. What do you mean? You are saved! Saved! See! See! said the young girl. Morel took the purse and started as he did so, for a vague remembrance reminded him that it once belonged to himself. At one end was the receipted bill for the 287,000 francs, and at the other was a diamond as large as a hazelnut, with these words on a small slip of parchment. Julie's Dowry Morel passed his hand over his brow. It seemed to him a dream. At this moment the clock struck eleven. He felt as if each stroke of the hammer fell upon his heart. Explain, my child, he said. Explain, my child, he said. Explain, where did you find this purse? In a house in the Allée de Meillon, numero quinze, on the corner of a mantelpiece in a small room on the fifth floor. But, cried Morel, this purse is not yours. Julie handed to her father the letter she had received in the morning. And did you go alone? asked Morel after he had read it. Emmanuel accompanied me, father. He was to have waited for me at the corner of the Rue de Musée, but, strange to say, he was not there when I returned. Monsieur Morel, exclaimed a voice on the stairs. Monsieur Morel! It is his voice, said Julie. At this moment, Emmanuel entered, his countenance full of animation and joy. The pharaoh, he cried. The pharaoh. What? What? The pharaoh? Are you mad, Emmanuel? You know the vessel is lost. The pharaoh, sir. They signal the pharaoh. The pharaoh is entering the harbour. Morel fell back in his chair. His strength was failing him. His understanding, weakened by such events, refused to comprehend such incredible, unheard-of, fabulous facts. But his son came in. Father, cried Maximilian, how could you say the pharaoh was lost? The lookout has signaled her, and they say she is now coming into port. My dear friends, said Morel, if this be so, it must be a miracle of heaven. Impossible! Impossible! But what was real and not less incredible was the purse he held in his hand, the acceptance receipted, the splendid diamond. Ah, oh, sir! exclaimed Cochle. What can it mean? The fair one! Come, dear ones, said Morel, rising from his seat. Let us go and see. And heaven have pity upon us, if it be false intelligence. They all went out, and on the stairs met Madame Morel, who had been afraid to go up into the study. In a moment they were at the Canabière. There was a crowd on the pier. All the crowd gave way before Morel. The pharaoh, the pharaoh, said every voice. And, wonderful to see, in front of the tower of Saint-Jean, was a ship bearing on her stern these words printed in white letters. The Ferron, Morel and son of Marseille. She was the exact duplicate of the other Ferron, and loaded as that had been with cochineal and indigo. 
She cast anchor, clued up sails, and on the deck was Captain Gomard giving orders, and good old Penelon making signals to Monsieur Morel. To doubt any longer was impossible. There was the evidence of the senses and ten thousand persons who came to corroborate the testimony. As Morel and his son embraced on the pier head, in the presence and amid the applause of the whole city witnessing this event, a man with his face half covered by a black beard and who concealed behind the sentry box watched the scene with delight, uttered these words in a low tone Be happy, noble heart. Be blessed for all the good thou hast done and wilt do hereafter, and let my gratitude remain in obscurity, like your good deeds. And with a smile expressive of supreme content, he left his hiding place, and without being observed, descended one of the flights of steps provided for debarkation, and hailing three times, shouted, Jacopo, Jacopo, Jacopo! Then a launch came to shore, took him on board, and conveyed him to a yacht splendidly fitted up, on whose deck he sprung with the activity of a sailor. Then he once again looked towards Morel, who, weeping with joy, was shaking hands most cordially with all the crowd around him, and thanking with a look the unknown benefactor whom he seemed to be seeking in the skies. And now, said the unknown, farewell kindness, humanity, and gratitude. Farewell to all the feelings that expand the heart. I have been heaven's substitute to recompense the good. Now the god of vengeance yields to me his power to punish the wicked. At these words he gave a signal, and as if only waiting this signal, the yacht instantly put out to sea. End of chapter 30 That last bit is what I loved about this chapter. This was one of those chapters when I finished reading it, I had to I had to bother Andrew and say, oh my gosh, this is amazing. Listen to what Dumas does here. Farewell goodness. This is the turning point. It could not be clearer than this. He has done all of the good stuff that he is going to do here. He's been the loving God. He's been the hand of providence doling out rewards for virtue. And now he's going to switch. So starting next episode, everything is going to change. And I mean everything is going to change for a little while. And it threw me the first time. But I trusted that it was all going to be okay because this chapter just nailed it, I thought. And I loved, loved that at the very end, who does he call for? Jacopo. Jacopo's back. He's on the boat. He's hanging with the Count. This is awesome. So he's not just rewarding the good, but he's taking care of the people who matter to him. People who've been good to him. And not just good to him, but good, kind of a platonic ideal of good. Just good people. He's been good to, too. I hope you caught that Maximilian Morel, Monsieur Morel's son, who was called back from serving in the army. He's the one that they refer to as the Stoic. You will see him again, and this virtuous strain, this need to be a virtuous person, which makes a lot of sense being the son of Monsieur Morel, who also was, I think, an incredibly virtuous person, that all comes into play. And so understanding him from the get-go I thought was kind of interesting. But I also thought, rarely have I been so stressed reading a section of a book as I was as I was, as I worried that Monsieur Morel was going to shoot himself before Dantes could get there, is heartbreaking, absolutely heartbreaking. And and again, were you able to wrap your mind around how much money Morel was short? So he would managed to round up about two hundred thousand dollars U.S. And what he owed was a little over four million dollars. U.S. today's currency. And I know it's, it's pretty obvious when you see he has 14,000 francs and he owes 287,000 francs, but somehow 
those numbers, you kind of, well, I, I have a fairly easy time kind of looking at them and thinking, oh, well, sure, big numbers. Look at them. There are lots of zeros. <laughs> so they have to be big numbers. But somehow translating it into modern currency makes it a lot more scary to me. So having Dantes show up with gold in the bag. By the way, did you catch where Morel's daughter had to go to pick up the red purse that he'd gotten from Caterus or that he'd found out about from Caterus? Where he had had her go was the fifth floor of the building down that street, and that was where his dad and he had lived. So that's the building that he owns now, and he's got that room reserved for himself. And now we're starting to see how he's decided to use it. On a slightly goofier note, I heard the name of the street that they were walking down to get to the old port, and it's Canebier Street. And I thought, huh, he just said in the version of the text that I was looking at, which was the newer translation, that they walked down Canebier and went to the port. And I thought, they walked down the Canebier. What is it that that is? Well, it's the old high street for old Marseille leading down to the port. And in fact, if you look on a map, and I've linked out to two different versions, uh, one from 1720 and one modern one that you kind of have to turn on its side to make sense with the old map. If you look at it, you can see really clearly how it went from city center down to the port, which of course makes perfect sense because the port was kind of the heart of everything back then, the, the shipping industry. Well, I still thought it was kind of funny. Some bell was ringing in the back of my head. And so I went and I actually looked it up. And it turns out that Marseille, back in the back of the day, had been surrounded by the largest hemp fields in the area. And so all the ropes, the big hemp ropes for the ships and everything, this is where they got their hemp from. And so Canapier is cannabis. And that's what the street was originally named for. So times change, stuff changes. But I love that this was the name of the street. This is still the name of the street. And of course, it's Canapier Street. <laughs> it's kind of perfect. Ah, history. It's good stuff. But I need to thank our Patreons. These are people who became Patreon patrons for Craftlet during the month of June 2016. Those people are Carol F., Lori D., Margaret D., Melanie P., Sarah M., and Darlene G. Thank you so much for supporting Craftlet over at patreon.com slash craftlet. Truly, truly appreciate it. All right, there's some great links over at craftlet.com slash 422. There is the little bitty poll to take if you have the time. And I have linked out to a blogger who, she sounds like one of us. Her, <laughs> her blog name is Madame Bibliophile Recommends, but she spells it Madame Bibi. B-I-B-I, Lophile recommends. And it's she has a great sense of humor and some really interesting takes on books that we've read, books that we haven't read, and just kind of a generally cheerful love of all things book. And not just books. She's not a snob. Movies too. She's had some really interesting kind of book and movie write-ups. So she's been writing for quite a while. So you will be able to have loads of fun reading the backlog of her entries. And that's all linked to from episode 422. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you, patrons. Thank you, Heat Index, for letting me record the whole episode. And I'll talk to you soon. Take care. Bye. If you like getting free audiobooks with benefits every week, please consider supporting the show over at patreon.com slash craftlet. There are rewards waiting for you beyond, you know, the free podcast. You can also subscribe to our premium streaming audio by tapping the red lock when you are looking at the app or at the show notes at craftlet.libsyn.com slash podcast. You can also sign up for a premium download subscription by following the links in the right-hand sidebar at craftlet.com. And if it's easier for you, you can always subscribe and review at iTunes and at Stitcher Radio. Like us on Facebook, support us at Patreon, and come with us on tour. 
For nine years, Craftlet has been kept going by the support of you, the listener. And for that, I am truly grateful. And remember, if your hands are too busy to pick up a book, at least you can turn one on 